Sure. Good morning. My name is Barbara Fuller. As chair of the board, I welcome you to this January 18th, 2022 working session of the Washtenaw County Board of Road Commissioners. Our communications manager, Emily Kaiser, will describe how our working sessions operate, how to access the agenda, and how you may participate remotely. Emily. Thanks, Commissioner. So there are multiple ways to make public comments today during the meeting, whether you're joining us in person or virtually. If you're here in person and would like to make public comment, please fill out the sign-in sheet over here. If you're joining us virtually, we'll ask you to virtually raise your hand at the appropriate time in the agenda. If you're joining us virtually, the chat feature on this Zoom meeting is available only as technical support for users on their computer or smartphone. If you're experiencing technical issues with audio or video during the meeting, please submit a comment in the chat feature and I will help you troubleshoot. If you are a staff member experiencing issues, please contact the IT Help Desk for assistance. The audio and video of this meeting is being recorded. A link to the video recording will be posted to wcroads.org in the next day or two. There are also printed copies of today's working session agenda on the table here and it's posted to our website, wcroads.org. There's a link available in the chat if you're joining us from your computer or smartphone. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Emily. Um, I want to note that Commissioners Green and Lamas have requested excused absences. And with that, Erin, would you please call the roll? Chair Burr Fuller. Present. Commissioner Doug Fuller. Present. Commissioner Joanne McCollum. Present. Managing Director Cheryl Siddle. Present. Director of Engineering and County Highway Engineer Matt McDonald. Present. Director of Operations Jim Harmon. Present. And um, Dan Ackerman, Director of Finance and IT, has an excused absence. Thank you, Erin. Um, at this time, I would ask if there is anyone who wishes to participate remotely. Make public, 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 public participation. Yeah, let me I'll provide some instructions for that. Oh, how about if you do that? Okay. <laughs> so since this is a hybrid meeting, both in-person and virtual attendees, uh, either can take turns to provide public comment today. So if you are attending virtually, we ask that you virtually raise your hand now. If you're viewing the meeting on your computer, first make sure to click join audio. You can then raise your hand by clicking the participants or the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and then the raise hand button. If you dial into the meeting from your touchtone phone, raise your hand by dialing star nine now. I will unmute virtual participants with raised hands one at a time. I will announce your username or the last four digits of your phone number when it is your turn to speak. Please share your name and address before beginning your comments. For in-person attendees, I will start with those of you who signed in on the sign-in sheet as you walked in. If you didn't sign in, you're still welcome to make comment. I'll no notify you when it is your turn. At this time, Commissioner, there's nobody with a raised hand and nobody on the sign-in sheet. Very good. Thank you, Emily. Um, at this time, uh, the item on our agenda next is the Advanced Traffic Management System. We're hearing from the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office, and I'm going to turn this over to Cheryl. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, actually, uh, thank you this morning. We have several representatives from the Washtenaw County um, Sheriff's Office. So um, we have a presentation that we worked together with them on. Um, it's about our traffic signal system, and Brent Schlack, our Assistant Director of Engineering, um, will be leading that presentation, um, and then certainly um, asking the Sheriff's office staff to help out where they can, um, and we look forward to sharing some information with you. So with that, Brent, I'd be happy to hand it over to you. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, thank you, Board, for... Uh putting me on the agenda to describe uh, our system and uh, something that we've been working a long time with with the Sheriff's Department to try and get them connected to uh, a lot of the data and uh, information that we, uh, that we have within our house. Um, so with that, we have our advanced traffic management system. It, we like our acronyms and so we, have, we call it ATMS. Uh, so you may see that, I don't know if that's within the presentation, I, I, but it may be there. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide. If I could interrupt, please, Brent, just for a moment. Would you yeah. note for the record and for people who are listening uh, and also for the recording, who is representing the Sheriff's Department today with us? Um, 
from my knowledge, we have uh, Dave Haltman. Um, and Dave, you're going to have to give your uh, uh, your title. Uh, Sheriff Clayton, of course, uh, is here. Um, Rocky Noonan, uh, part of the Sheriff's Department. Um, and I'm not sure if there's anyone else. Hey, Brett. Uh, yeah. yeah, if I can help you out really quick. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank point. you. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. So good morning, and I, I know I'll get a chance to address you again in a few minutes. So we have uh, our retiring Director of Emergency Services, Dave Haltman here, newly appointed uh, Director of Emergency Services, uh, Rocky Noonan, and the uh, newly appointed Dispatch Manager, uh, Jeff Poynier from the Sheriff's Office is present. Thank you, Sheriff Clayton. Back Thank to you. you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for helping me out there. Uh, so on the agenda, we have uh, uh, some background from, you know, how we started this system. And uh, then we'll go through uh, an overview from the county sheriffs and, and then our next steps. You can go to the next slide. So some background for our system. Uh, so we own and maintain 175 traffic signals and uh, flashing beacons. Uh, of those, about 81 of them are MDOT traffic signals and flashers. Uh, we uh, perform or assist maintenance for uh, cities and villages. Uh, City of Milan, we have an uh, agreement uh, that we go down and we assist them with their maintenance. Uh, and then we also assist City of Chelsea, City of Saline when they need it. Uh, even the city of Ann Arbor, whenever uh, uh, we have a good working relationship, they, they sometimes come and help us and we, we go we return the favor. If you can go to the next slide. So back in 2011, we uh, deployed the ATMS or the Advanced Traffic Management System, and it's called KITS, which stands for Kimley Horn Integrated Transportation System. And I'll give you, uh, later on, I'll give you a screenshot of what that looks like. You can go to the next slide. So, so when we um, deployed that, we initially deployed it with 35 traffic signals and seven of those were along MDOT routes. We had seven, our 12 uh, CCTVs or surveillance cameras that were at our uh, intersections and some including uh, MDOT routes. Uh, with that, we also uh, installed three communication towers. Uh, our initial uh, communication towers were at our main yard, which is a 190 foot uh, tower, uh, one at the Miller Road Park and Ride. Uh, I believe that one's 100 feet tall. And then at our Southeast Service Center, uh, we also have another uh, tower, um, and that one's 150 foot tall. So that communicates, that's our backbone for our communication. So. From there, then we go down to the street and we basically daisy chain uh, to each intersection uh, because it has to be line of sight. So the communication that we have over those towers is a licensed frequency uh, communication. So it's our own uh, communication network and we're able to have that be secure and high speed. You can go to the next slide. So this is kind of a, just a snapshot. There's a lot going on here, uh, but in the background is the actual KITS program. And that's a map and you can see some green dots. Those are our actual traffic signals. Off to the left is the actual timing of the intersection. Um, in the middle is one of our cameras. So we're able to look down a corridor. This is looking from Carpenter and Packard, looking south. Uh, so we're able to see platoons of traffic, we're able to see if there's any incidents or uh, if there's any issues with the traffic signals. Um, and then off to the right is actually the front panel. So that's getting, we are able to communicate directly with that intersection right into the cabinet. And so we can see what's going on, if there's any issues, if, the, if there's any errors. So we're able to communicate with the controller. We're able to communicate, there's a conflict monitor in uh, the state of Michigan, you can't, or actually in the US, you can't have uh, a conflict monitor and a controller all in one, uh, uh, one box. 
So a conflict monitor just monitors what the colors are out there. So if you have conflicting colors, then it'll send the signal in the flash. Um, if you can go to the next slide. I, I don't know if we want to go. Uh, yeah, I guess this it does have a video. So uh, so uh, as you can see, as you're playing this, this uh, actually is what we're viewing. And you can see the signal uh, operating. Uh, and we're able to monitor if everything's timed properly or if, if there's any issues uh, with turning vehicles or even in some instances uh, what the weather looks like out there. Um, I don't know if we want to take questions now, Emily. I see that Barb rose her hand. Absolutely. I mean, that's a typing, so I think that'd be helpful since it's a working session. Thank you. Um, Brent, are we recording or are we just watching in real time just to have a sense of how this works currently from our point of view? Yeah, great question. Uh, we do not record. It is live uh, video and uh, we, we just monitor it um, whenever it's live. We do, we do not record. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to know, um, I may not recognize it, but do you, are, can you get the speed of the vehicles from this? We cannot. Um, we we don't have that. The some of the newer cameras you probably could. Uh, there's some devices out there that you can get speed. There's some uh, uh, radar type uh, uh, vehicle detectors uh, that you're able to get speed. Um, but again, I, I don't know how accurate. I mean, it's pretty accurate, but I wouldn't say it's their exact speed. So no, we don't. For the most part, we, the equipment we have out there, we're not able to monitor the speed of the vehicle. Okay, thank you. You can go to the next slide. So the other feature that we have within our system is it's able to notify us uh, through a text that the, there's some issue with the signal. So if our signal goes in the flash, or if there's some, we set these alerts up. So if you see the box in the middle, that's the box that we're able to set that up based on if there's uh, certain, uh, you know, if the signal is operating a certain way, then we can say, hey, alert us through a text or alert us through an email or just put an alert uh, in the system. Uh, so a lot of times if the signal goes into uh, flash or if it goes, uh, goes dark or if somebody gets into the cabinet, we're, it'll notify us and we'll know prior to we get uh, bef before we get a call from dispatch in a lot of cases uh, the only uh, instance where that can be an issue is if we actually lose power then uh, we'll get we'll get a notification that there there was some uh, power outage uh, but it, we will not be able to see uh, what's happening because there's there's not any power so we've recognized that uh, and what we've started to put into place is battery backup. So uh, I don't have the number of intersections, but it's, it's quite a few that we have and we've installed battery backup. So that signal, depending on how big the intersection is, can run anywhere from six to 10 hours. And with that, and the reason we put that in place is so that we can use a lot of the features that we have. Um, and then we can see those and it can get back to us. So we have that at uh, certain intersections. I believe we have it all down Carpenter and a lot of the Ipsy Critchfield area um, within Sile Township. Uh, and we also have it at all of our towers. You can go to the next slide. So our current status. So since 2011, we've grown quite a bit. So now we have 105 intersections connected, 84 of those of ours and 21 are MDOT. We have 45 cameras, uh, six communication towers now. Uh, we have two, uh, our advanced traffic management uh, computer servers, one video server and uh, one network management server and a firewall. So we've really grown and we've gotten heavily into IT 
Uh, and with that, uh, we, we do have a managed service provider in uh, Integral Blue um, that uh, does help us with our IT along with Chris. Chris does a great job uh, trying to point out if he's seeing issues with our system and then we can get that over to him to get it um, to fix. So, um, so yeah, so we've grown quite a bit since 2011. Uh, we can go to the next slide now. So with our video management, we utilize, it's called Genetech. Um, it's, and I'll show you a screenshot in a minute. Uh, we used to have uh, our video through kits, through our ATMS, and that worked out great. Uh, but we, what we realized was that we had a very valuable tool that could be used in a lot of different areas, um, uh, you know, outside of just monitoring traffic. And some of those are, you know, of course, we monitor the traffic signal operations, uh, weather events. Uh, Jim and his staff, I know, uh, look at the cameras quite often. If there's any incidents, uh, if we have citizen requests, we can uh, see if we have a camera in the area and we can actually zoom right down to great detail to look at if a uh, um, pedestrian pedestal got hit. And, well, what, what, what components do we need? And so we can get those out of our yard uh, and respond to that, uh, that knockdown. Uh, emergency calls. So if we get an emergency call at the middle of the night, um, we were able to go and look at that intersection and then say, Yep, uh, it's something we need to respond to right away, or it looks like it's operating uh, adequately, and we can respond in the morning. Um, a lot of times we get emergency calls, and it'll be signal malfunction, and uh, you know, well, what is that? And uh, so we, uh, so we're able to then investigate a little bit further, and and then make a determination if we need to respond or not. Um, so Genetech is the video management uh, that we uh, help the sheriff's department with. Uh, so they also have that uh, management system, and uh, so it, it works really well um, uh, whenever we uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, allow them to, to gain access to that, uh, to that video. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so now uh, we're getting into uh, where we are actually um, providing some of our data. So back in 2015, we approved, uh, the board approved an agreement with, it's called Traffic Technology Services. Um, it's a connected vehicle service where they're actually looking at our traffic signal and how it's timing and uh, providing that data into the vehicle. So it's BMW, um, I think Volvo, uh, and a couple other cars, they're actually able to uh, go down some of our corridors and see what that timing is. It helps with start stop. Uh, so uh, a lot of the newer vehicles, they'll turn off when you get to a signal. Well, if the vehicle knows the timing of the intersection, it can start that vehicle up prior to it turning green. Um, so I believe the next slide, I have to have a video that kind of goes through this. I don't know if the, I can't hear the volume. I don't know if. Yeah, we won't be able to hear the volume, Oh, that's a bummer. Sorry. <laughs> that's, too, that's too complicated for our current session. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Uh, we'll work through it. Um, so again, it, it's, uh, so this is the display that's within the vehicle. Um, so an actual vehicle may be able to optimize their speed to be able to if we have the, inter the corridor uh, coordinated and be able to get green lights going through the corridor, um, it actually uh, will respond this. So it's uh, how much time before it turns green. Um, there are some safety features they put in place so that it turns off. Uh, so you can see it, uh, it turned off uh, so that people aren't trying to gun through the the red, so they're actually looking at the, the red signal. I see Barb has her hand up. So I'm trying to understand what you're saying here. Is this our um, active traffic management system 
essentially talking to vehicles and is it is yes to autonomous vehicle deployment where yeah so the uh this we're we're just supplying them a connection and data uh they actually built a platform within kits uh through kinley horn so it's another reason why we like it because we're actually able to get data out of it we're able to see the effectiveness of the intersection based on that connected vehicle and what experience they're having um so yeah so it basically is whenever we pull up the kits and we can see how at times it's providing that data um, to through to uh, TTS's server, and then they're a, they're uh, optimizing that and running that through an algorithm, and then they're sending that wirelessly to the vehicle. So, so I'm driving a car that's equipped with this fancy pants technology. Do I see all these messages? The traffic lights going to turn green in five seconds. I mean. I, Oh. No, it, it just provides that countdown. Uh, so it, it will, it'll show you how much time is left on the green. It'll show you, uh, it'll count down, like say it's red and this is how many seconds it turns green. So it's like a hawk signal in my car? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> helpful bar because it helps us with signal timing it keeps vehicles if they're if they're following and using the information it helps platoon the vehicles as they're traveling traveling along the corridor uh -huh. so certainly um you know again back in 2015 this was this is an example of an agreement where we've already entered into allowing that data sharing that there it are definitely advantages to the Washtenaw County Road Commission for sharing this information. And that's part of why we even entertained the request back, you know, six, seven years ago. Yeah, I'm just worried about distracted drivers and are they going to... If the heads up display, um, we actually, several staff had the opportunity to, to test drive some of these audits that had this, you know, this technology in it. Needless to say, it's slick. But it definitely is, is helpful because it does give you, again, it gives you that recommended speed to travel so that you are not coming to a complete stop. It does allow that, you know, that we're all about smooth traffic, right? That's when we talk about speed limits and all those other things. We want that traffic traveling uniformly because that's the safest way for traffic to travel. So this is yet another tool that's available for those, obviously, that have the means to have a vehicle that has this technology in it. Um, but it is, a, it's a heads up display and it, it's, it's pretty slick. Hey, Commissioner McCollum also has a hand up. Yeah, um, I'm thinking that it's going to help with the, it, this would help with the yellow light dilemma. Exactly. Rushing through or stop. Exactly. <laughs> yes, it will. It will. And yeah, so it, it can give recommendations on speed. It can give that countdown for how much time is left in the green and uh, count down to uh, how much time is left in the red, um, which then helps again with that start stop feature within the vehicle. Um, it does not provide any safety messages, you know, where, you know, vehicle stopped ahead or anything like that. It's just providing, they call it SPAT, it's signal phase and timing. So that's uh, it's providing that phase and timing of the intersection. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so the one, uh, uh, the one reason we're here is uh, the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office uh, is uh, interested in, we're in, along with us, in sharing our data with them. So, but one area that I, I thought would be important is back in 2019, we had a, a grant that um, looked at improving our system, but it also established that connection between our building and the building next door. Um, it said, we, we knew this uh, was coming uh, or we had, uh, there was some uh, discussion on the Emergency Operations Center moving next door. So in 2019, we put in the, the fiber that connects uh, 
through our system and put in some hand holes and basically we left it outside of uh, the building. And then whenever uh, the sheriff's department, and I'm sure they'll describe uh, what they've gone through, uh, they uh, finished that out and they brought that into the building. Um, so this uh, will allow for future sharing of our ATMS uh, along with our cameras. Uh, so we see that as a huge benefit uh, for incidents that are out there. Uh, I, I believe I have the next slide. If you go to the next slide, I think I have some examples. Uh, so this is uh, the Genetech software. Um, you can see this is Clark and Golf side. Uh, uh, looks like we had some a few other cameras open. Um, so this is the dashboard that you're actually able to go in and uh, pan, tilt, and zoom. So you can see there's a fire truck uh, coming down the road. Uh, so it it will provide a level a more level of detail for that dispatch center on actually having eyes out uh, on, the, on the street when there's an incident. And we see that as a huge benefit to our county. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So there's another example as well. Commissioner McCall. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I was just wondering why certain streets are highlighted in red. So those cameras are down. Like the, the communication, there's some issue with them. Uh, so it highlights that. Uh, for us. Thank you. Yep. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So this is another example. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, commencement for Eastern Michigan, you know, back whenever we could uh, have big groups of people. Um, and we'll get there someday. Uh, but we're able to, you're able to monitor that event. You know, you can see in the middle, almost in the middle of the picture, there's an officer in the middle of the road. Uh, so anytime you're putting those officers out in harm's way like that, that, you know, that of course is nerve wracking for the officer. But and when you have that much traffic and that many people with, you know, who knows what can happen, it's just really nice to, be able to capture this and then even use it for training or to uh, to go back and review the if there was you know any incident uh, that happened during the event. Um, they're also able in this uh, case uh, we have our signal at Hewitt and Hearner Drive, um, and they actually took control of that signal. And we're, we were actually able to see that and we can monitor um, how they're using that, that signal. So as soon as they open the cabinet, we get an alert and uh, then they take control and they put it into manual control and uh, they're able to cycle through all of the different phases. So that's just a, a couple examples of uh, where, again, we've been working, gosh, for the last 10 years or so with the Sheriff's Department. Um, uh, Sheriff Clayton came in, gosh, about 10 years ago and, uh, you know, described, I think at that time they were looking at body cams, um, but uh, we kind of presented our system then to him. And, uh, and at that point, we were really working closely together to hopefully someday in the future make this uh, come to fruition. Um, so unless there's any questions, I can uh, turn it over to the Sheriff's Department and then uh, I'll follow that up with some next steps uh, for for the board and uh, some future things we're looking at with our system. I don't see any questions. Commissioner Fuller, would it be a nice opportunity um, for Sheriff Slayton or for Dave Hulkman to be able to speak? Um, as Brent indicated, we have been having these conversations on and off for the better part of 10 years. Um, about uh, clearly we've worked together for a very long time and as the technology has changed for both of our organizations we've certainly been able to leverage um, that technology and, and to take advantage of the resources that we can offer to each other um, and for example uh, you know moving next door has, has been in the works for quite some time which is why we took advantage of of the ability to at least put that fiber um, partially in place as part of one of the grants that we had 
And I know that likewise, the sheriff's office um, has been doing similar type improvements over the years, working um, ultimately towards the ability to be able to share um, the information that we can, can observe out on the street with the system that we have in place. Um, so I'd be happy, I don't know, Dave or if you were sure you would like to speak. I think the sheriff has some comments initially, and I can answer any questions. Sure. Yeah, so, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, good. So first off, thanks, Brent, for, for providing that, that presentation or this part of the presentation and sort of setting it up into the Road Commission staff and board. Uh, he's correct. We've had, the, we've been on having this conversation for, for over a decade, sort of anticipate, trying to anticipate, you know, what the future needs are and what some opportunities are for us to continue our collaboration. Um, pleasure to present to you. I see some of my good friends on on the board here, Barb and Doug and, and, and Joanne. Um, we're excited about enhancing the partnership with the Road Commission and the Sheriff's Office, uh, really building upon our existing collaborative efforts. Uh, we've, you know, coordinating responses to critical events in Washington County, from roadway obstructions to uh, natural uh, events that cause emergencies, hazmat snow uh, situation. So our relationship, as you know, with the Road Commission has been strong and, and the people of Washington County have benefited uh, because of that. Really quick, by way of a brief review, uh, Sheriff's Office Metro Dispatch provides services uh, covering uh, approximately 93% of the annual emergency calls nationwide, I mean, uh, uh, countywide. We know we have uh, other PSAPs in, in Washington County delivering uh, police dispatch, Milan, Celine, Chelsea, uh, U of M, EMU. Uh, obviously, we don't provide those for prime, as a primary uh, PSAP, but, but we coordinate with them as well, right? Also coordinate with HVA, which dispatches fire. So uh, our Metro dispatch really serves as the hub for emergency communications in Washington County. And, and combined with emergency management operations, you know, forms our emergency services division, which Dave is the director of uh, retiring out and Rocky is the, the new emergency director, uh, services director. Both of them will speak in a second, uh, in addition to, to Jeff, who's the manager of Metro Dispatch. Uh, with the consolidation of Ypsilanti City, Ann Arbor City, Pittsfield Township, and to our dispatch operations, you know, we have realized greater efficiencies and coordination of police services response. Uh, we, we like to think about it like this, crime and criminal behavior is not restricted by jurisdictional boundaries, only government is. So we hamper our own response and preventive strategies around managing crime and criminal behavior and enhancing public safety because sometimes we put in these artificial uh, boundaries that are jurisdictional. We've been able to, to, to really blow a lot of that up in Washington County because we've integrated a lot of the dispatch services. Um, and this is important because we, you know, we, we're seeing a consistent increase in various crime, uh, uh, kinds of criminal behavior that threaten public safety. And, and as a result, you know, we've had to continuously develop preventive and reactive strategies and try to think about how do we leverage technology to make us more effective. And as we consider the development of our new emergency services communication center now sitting on Zeeb Road, we really tried to think about two things. We tried to plan for today's reality and anticipate future challenges. And even before we got the millage that really positioned us to uh, make this move for the emergency Ser services communication center, as Brent discussed, we talked about this integration of road commission technology and sheriff's offices uh, dispatch services way back when, because we could anticipate that we'd end up in the space that we're, we're, we're in now. Uh, we're really focused on strategies to enhance response to critical uh, community events by leveraging various forms of technology. But I also want to say we're very respectful of the public's concerns about uh, privacy as well. There is a, a natural and I think an appropriate tension that exists not just here in Washington County, but nationally around, wait a minute, technology is great, but we don't want to give up all of our privacy. How is Big Brother watching? How, is they, how are they going to use all that information? And, and our staff will talk a little bit about the conversations we've had with your staff to this point, because we know that that's always going to be an issue when we start thinking about uh, police, law enforcement, criminal justice organizations having access to, uh, to community images. 
Um, we we engaged the road commission team, discussed the possibility of gaining access to the systems, as we said before. Uh, and I do believe that this enhances our ability to provide uh, proactive and reactive services to the community. And I think that's important. Um, we hope to not only uh, leverage road commission technology, but it really is our vision to expand that to include uh, the business community and others. So we have all the, the ability to access video images uh, countywide and our ability to thoughtfully and strategically leverage that technology to help enhance our responses, I think also helps enhance public safety. Again, to do it in a way that doesn't compromise uh, our individual privacy. Uh, it is not our intent to um, spend all of our time monitoring and recording all these, these images. This is really based on uh, two things. From a traffic standpoint, being able to monitor traffic flow so we can assist in traffic management from a police standpoint, and our staff, will, my staff will talk a little bit about that, but also our ability to respond to um, certain situations. So we believe that a key part of the charge for Metro Dispatch is, you know, putting the right resources in the right place at the right time. Uh, and I'll give you an example, responding to an active shooter or active aggressor event. Our ability to quickly and safely direct first responders uh, to an event that may happen in our county may save countless lives. You know, in Oxford, the fact that they had a school resource officer that, that responded to that shooter within five minutes, we, we, I think we all believe, save countless lives. Hopefully, we never have an event like this in Washington County. But if we do, our ability to send the right first responders the right way to an event by leveraging the visual images that we get through road commission cameras, we think would save lives. Again, hopefully, we never have to um, test that theory, but we believe it pushes us in the position that in the event that one of these things happens in Washington County, we're in a better position to pe keep people safe. So it's not just responding to active aggressor. Um, Brent talked about it, you know, our ability to monitor traffic in, in, in large events, uh, our ability to, after the fact, review some of these images for training purposes, for um, to, to inform the, and when we have another event, what's the better strategy? You know, all of those things I think are beneficial. Uh, so I, I've talked enough. That's about the level, uh, the level that I can talk from. A, uh, uh, and you don't want me to get into talking about the specifics of technology uh, and some of the specifics of the conversations that our staff and the Road Commission team have had. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave, uh, Director Noonan, and um, Jeff Poynier so they can talk specifically about any of the technology issues, uh, retention, FOIA, those type of things. Dave? Yes. All right. Good morning. Everyone want to hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I, you know, it's hard to follow the share. You're so good at kind of putting it all together in such a good, elegant way. Uh, but I will ex explain a little bit of the use and the value of our partnership with this video display system. Uh, much like the Road Commission values the situational awareness of seeing what's going on roads right now, whether it be weather or traffic patterns and traffic flow, we are highly value situational awareness when it comes to these crashes. Uh, that occur in the intersections with, uh, with something that can help us with uh, sending the right resources to an event or considering such an event as a hazardous materials incident. And we can view that on the camera and kind of assess visually in the dispatch center. Uh, and in the dispatch center, I'll say we have a video wall that is comprised of 12 different screens that are all stitched together or independent video. And pretty much half of those have been dedicated lately to reviewing and, and being able to view the Road Commission's camera system so that we can get used to it and the value of how it can be utilized within our operations. Um, going forward, you know, we will we'll be recording some of these cameras, not all of them, but we will determine, based on some of our crash statistics, some of the most critical intersections around the county. And we are, since we've been talking about this uh, video sharing agreement and pending your approval, we've also been talking internally about policies regarding access, uh, retention, um, how these will be utilized going forward. And that's the, the part of the data that we feel will be highly valuable to us going forward with investigations and such. Um, not sure if you have any specific questions about our use of the video, but for us, again, it's, it's being able to access those cameras 
on the fly and to see things that are occurring in real time so that we can provide the right response for you know first responders. Yeah, all right. Um, question, Dave. So the sheriff's department would be doing the recording of selected cameras. The road commission would not be correct. recording. Correct. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. And your user agreement puts the onus on the sheriff's office for how that video is distributed or used. Okay. Cheryl, do you have a comment? Yeah. Um, just a follow up to that very question. Um, we are occasionally asked through the Freedom of Information Act um, process for copies of any video recording that we have, which of course we don't record, so that's sort of an easy answer for us. Is there a process um, for that same information that gets recorded to the Sheriff's Department? There is. Uh, in fact, we we deal with FOIA on a daily basis, um, obviously with 911 recordings, radio traffic, uh, prosecutor's office request 911 calls multiple every week. So this will fall under that same sort of policy as far as FOIA. Uh, what we will though do is tailor the retention and policy going forward as far as access and how long those videos are recorded or retained. There may be certain videos that are flagged as holding for longer than the general retention period because of the value of the, or the level of the crime or incident that occurred. But other than that, it will follow our general sheriff's office FOIA policy. My concern was just to distinguish who's got the recordings. And it's not the road commission, it's the sheriff's. It's the sheriff's office. That is correct. Other questions or concerns? Comments for me? Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the concerns I had, I'm, I live in a rural area where police monitors are, I won't say they're prevalent, but folks have police monitors to tune in to what's going on. Is the public going to be able to live stream what you are seeing? Oh, no. No, this is a closed network. I, I think Brent uh, can speak specifically to that, but yes, it's a closed network only available within your, your network and our connection. That's all the questions I had. Anything? Oh, it sounds good. I'm yeah. glad it's happening. <laughs> yeah, we highly value. I mean, I've been doing this with the sheriff's office for 30 years, and the, the road commission's always been a great partner. And this is just one extreme example of that. So Commissioner Fuller, anything? No. Huh? Thank, Thank you, Dave. Thank, Thank you, you, Sheriff Clayton. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And we again, we really appreciate the partnership and look forward to continuing. Cheryl, I think that Brent just has uh, some conclusion remarks. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Sheriff Clayton and uh, Dave for uh, your presentation. Uh, again, that highlights something we've been working on for a very long time. Um, so our next steps, uh, if you wanna go to the next slide. Uh, so February 1st, so next board meeting, we do have an agreement that we've prepared and actually the uh, sheriff has signed it. Um, and uh, we'll be providing that to the board for review, and then that'll be for uh, your approval at the next board meeting. Um, it's a quite lengthy uh, document, so we'll make sure we get that into your hands uh, as soon as we can. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, I'll just kinda touch on some of the future projects that we have uh, with our system. Uh, so we're looking at an uh, adaptive traffic signal control. Uh, it's called Cadence. Um, and we're going to have it this year along Jackson Road and then next year along Plymouth Road. And what that'll do is it'll monitor if there's an incident on I-94, for instance, um, it will, and vehicles are getting off at Fletcher Road, uh, if they're heading eastbound, um, they're able to get on Jackson Road. And a lot of times, uh, there's quite a long distance between Fletcher Road and the next exit, Baker Road. Uh, so a lot of vehicles uh, use that secondary route to get around the incident. So the adaptive signal control will actually be able to monitor when vehicles are, are uh, getting off the freeway, and then we'll be able to adjust those signals on the fly. Uh, and uh, it'll look and has a logarithm that looks at, all right, what's the 
distance between vehicles, how many vehicles, what's, and then be able to send that to the other intersections along that corridor, including the intersections of MDOT at Baker Road and at Zeeb Road, uh, so that we can then help them along Jackson Road and uh, get them back onto the freeway. Uh, same thing on Plymouth Road. So if there's an incident on US 23 or on uh, M14, uh, a lot of vehicles get off at uh, um, M153 or road and uh, take Plymouth Road all the way over to US 23. So again, we'll be able to communicate uh, and we're communicating today with all those intersections, but uh, this will monitor it and monitor those, uh, uh, if there's any incidents and monitor the, the vehicle volume um, and then be able to adjust those signals um, based on what it's seeing. So we're excited to have that uh, come to our county and or come to the road commission and uh, be able to help out those corridors. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. Yeah, oh. Oh, yeah. oh gosh, all right. Yeah. All right, I didn't see the hands up, sorry. That's okay. I was wondering how the adaptive traffic signal control works. Is someone manually, they, they watch and see something happen? And no, it's a, it's a, actually, it's part of the software package. So it's, uh, it's monitored. We have vehicle detection within the roadway. And so we have that at the stop bar. And then we have it in advance about three, 350 feet away from the intersection. And it's, it's basically looking at the, the volume of uh, vehicles. Uh, they call it the head space, so the headway, like basically how much space there is between the vehicles. Um, and then it puts that into an algorithm that then uh, determines what that cycle length and how long those phases should be. Okay. So we have to put in a lot of data uh, for it to then take what, what it's seeing and then adjust the signal. So, so Brent, my question is, I, maybe you covered this. So not every intersection has cameras, but they have the monitors in the road surface, those orange dots that we see, is that right? That's right. Uh, so not every intersection, so the only uh, intersections that we're gonna have adaptive control uh, are along these two corridors and not every intersection has a camera. Our new standard is if we modernize or we have a new signal go in is for it to have a camera, but, but you're right, not every intersection has a camera. And then the orange dots, those are vehicle detectors. It's a wireless detector um, that where you basically put a four inch core in the, in the road and then you put this, it looks like a hockey puck and uh, they epoxy it into the roadway. And then that monitors the volume of traffic. Uh, it, and a lot of times we'll run our signals, they call it free. So it's based on vehicle demand. So if there's not a vehicle that shows up on that side street, it'll stay green for the main street. Um, so it, uh, it really helps with the efficiency of each intersection. So you mentioned the Fletcher Jackson bypass that gets used pretty regularly now that 94 is open again, not so much unless there's a crash. So is what's the situation at Parker and Jackson? Is that camera or is that hockey pucks? <laughs> so those will be those, uh, their, their census, yeah, the, the pucks will have those there at, at Parker Road. Uh, we're actually gonna be building a tower at the Fletcher and I-94 interchange. And we'll be putting those detectors uh, just after the ramps along Jackson Road uh, so that we can see how many vehicles are coming off the freeway to then send the message to the other intersections. So this um, is by a computer. My concern is that people like you are not glued to your cell phones 24-7 because of all this fancy technology. Yeah, no, it uh, basically will we'll, we'll work with Kimley Horn on uh, setting those intersections up so that it takes the data that's being uh, collected out in the street to then put it within their program and then that, that sends the, the new timing out. Commissioner McCullough? Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. Is okay. Oh, Your hands that's all right. 
so we're excited for uh for that to come and uh to uh learn more and see if there's other corridors you know uh, carpenter road would probably be another good corridor but a lot of those parallel routes to the freeway uh this will definitely benefit um and then if you want to yeah, go to the next slide so then we have uh, our wish list uh so another so kimley horn has developed a connected vehicle data dashboard uh that we're very interested in so uh right now uh, we talked about tts TTS has uh, where they wirelessly uh, th send through a cellular connection to the vehicle. Well, there's also another connection. It's called uh, DSRC, which is dedicated short range communication. It's actually a radio at the intersection. And then there's one in the vehicle. And then those have the uh, ability to send a safety message to. So, uh, so all that, those studies that were done through Umtree, that's the type of communication that they're utilizing. Well, uh, Kimley Horn, we, we've been really reluctant to get into that connected vehicle arena just because we really haven't seen the benefit or the data that would come back to us. Basically, it's like putting a black box at the intersection and then it just helps the vehicle. Well, that doesn't help us with our job and us monitoring the intersections and how effective they are. Well, now uh, Kinley Horn has developed this dashboard that will capture that data and then provide us information. So we're very excited to uh, look to get into that, uh, uh, that module here soon. Uh, transit signal priority is another one. Uh, actually, we're working with the ride. Uh, they're looking at, uh, uh, putting transit signal priority along the Washtenaw corridor, which uh, we communicate with through our system. Uh, and uh, so that would then be able to give priority to the, the bus uh, if, it's, if there's some issue. Uh, again, we have to work out through all the, the details on if they're behind scheduled, um, how many patrons are on the bus. And, you know, there's a lot, of, lot that goes into that. But that's one area that uh, we would look to... Uh, um, that we would have the ability to expand our system. And then emergency vehicle preemption, that's another area that uh, we would be able to uh, adjust our signals. If we get a, a call from a uh, fire truck and they're requesting preemption, then that message can go through our system and then we could uh, preempt the signals along their route. Grant? Yeah. He has a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, signal priority. Is it already a set of, or is that already happening where the because um, I heard this when they were doing the talking about the corridor for Washington Avenue that the lights would change for the buses they have a way to to control that yeah so they could uh, it's not in place um, oh. they could they could put a request in uh, and when I say a request basically the bus again there's a lot of uh, areas that would have to be certified, you know, uh, what's the current uh, timing along the corridor, how many patrons are on the bus, how far behind are they in schedule, um, are they ahead of schedule, and then that will determine whether or not they receive that priority. And a lot of times what that does is it doesn't necessarily send the signal out of step where it doesn't maintain the, the coordination. It just will maybe adjust a few seconds of here and steal some time uh, to uh, make sure that bus gets through the, the traffic signal. But for the most part, you know, along Washtenaw, that's where a lot of the vehicle, a lot of the volume is at. So we want uh, those signals to stay green uh, to get those platoons through. So, uh, so I don't see it requesting a lot, uh, but there, there may be times that uh, they're behind schedule and uh, to give them priority, you know, they're very close to the intersection or within, uh, uh, and it's about to go uh, red or yellow. Uh, so it then can extend that green by a few seconds to get that vehicle through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other uh, area that we're looking at would be uh, road weather information. Uh, again, this would help 
with uh, Jim and his staff uh, to help provide uh, information uh, with their decisions on what's happening uh, throughout the county. So, and I'm, I know Jim can, and he's described to this board, there's a lot of times we get uh, weather within the county and it's different in Linden Township than it is in Augusta Township. And uh, so we, uh, to have that information and be able to uh, adjust and uh, call in crews uh, where it's needed, uh, I, I think would be a benefit uh, for us. Uh, the last area is uh, uh, bicycle lane deck technology. So we have a lot of our roadways where we do have uh, bicycle lanes. Uh, and right now there's uh, not the ability for that bicycle to put a call into the intersection. Um, it's not a major issue. Uh, uh, they can, if they get stuck in an intersection, they can get off and push the push button, the pedestrian push button and uh, get the green. Uh, but there could be instances uh, where uh, some type of technology to detect where where they're at and uh, that they're at the intersection to give them the green would be a benefit. Um, so with that, I think that's uh, my presentation. Again, thank you. Um, I don't know if you can go to the next slide. I think that's it for me. Yep. So again, I appreciate uh, the sheriff's uh, coming and uh, the board allowed me to present uh, our system. It's something that uh, the board has been very supportive of and uh, it's, it's been a huge benefit for us uh, to be able to monitor our system. Commissioner McCollum? Yeah, uh, Brent, did you talk about the bicycle lane technology? Did I miss that? I did, yeah. So we, uh, the bicycle lane technology is where right now there's, uh, if they have a dedicated lane, there's not a detector uh, that's within that lane. They, they're they starting to develop uh, detectors, but a lot of times those, right now, those uh, detectors will pick up on uh, either the metal or, um, you know, the different components within the vehicle uh, to sense and then place that call in. Well, a lot of those bicycles are, um, you know, some type of, uh, graphite or I mean they're they're you know it's not a it's not a material that's got a, enough metal in it to provide that uh, for us to sense that they're there so uh, they've they're starting to get better with that technology but we also have the ability where they can have an like basically be like a emergency vehicle preamp where they have an application on their phone um, and then we'd be able to determine where they're at. Um, there are some issues with that. You know, again, you get into that big brother and oh. uh, all of that, but uh, it there's a lot of uh, cyclists out there that would appreciate it. And, uh, you know, they cycle, you know, they're a heavy user and to be able to understand and, have a technology that would help provide them a green for the uh, signal would, I think they would appreciate. So wait a minute, you're talking about giving cyclists the ability to control the traffic lights? <laughs> no, it, it's just a vehicle detector. So basically it's to detect that they're present. And then what? Like a little orange pop because Basically, it lets the traffic signal know that somebody's on that side street that would not otherwise be picked up by that little orange car. So the concern is they have red that never changed because right. nobody knows they're there. Exactly. Right. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Any so with that, yeah, I, again, thank you. Dave, any closing remarks you want to share with us? No, just uh, again, we highly value this partnership. We have a road commission. I think it works well for both of us. Thank you for being here today. It's always so nice to have a live body in the room. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, I'm ready oh, to share. To share. <laughs> Cheryl, um, well, that's um, what we have on the advanced traffic management system and certainly our partnership with the sheriff's um, office. I think the next step on the agenda is a brief break, and then from there we will go into the permitting process.
Perfect. So uh, we'll take a brief break if people want to. Emily, what do you want us to do? So you guys don't need to do anything up on your computers. I'm going to pause the recording. Welcome back, everyone. It's 1015 and we are going to reconvene our meeting. And the topic of the moment is the Washtenaw County Road Commission's permitting process. Cheryl, all to you. All right. Um, staff just thought that as we were looking at topics um, for working sessions, that this may be just a nice opportunity to give the board an overview of basically um, a life, a day in the life of permits, if that makes any sense. So Mark McCullough, who is the senior project manager and oversees um, our permits area, is going to run through the different types of permits um, that we issue and sort of what that process looks like if you are um, trying to go through the permitting process. So with that, I would be happy to hand it over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, first off, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to the board today. I'd uh, like to give special recognition to Matt McDonnell, our uh, County Highway Engineer slash Director of Engineering. I've learned a lot from him uh, since taking over for him in 2018 and uh, very fortunate to have him as uh, our, our leader of engineering and my boss to be able to give me insights uh, when needed to be able to uh, give successful outcomes for this agency. So appreciate his uh, his uh, commitment to that. With that, uh, I'm going to have four planned stopping points throughout this presentation, three in the middle, one at the end, uh, in order to give the board opportunities to ask questions uh, so that uh, we can keep the thing timely. And with that, I will go to the next slide. Go ahead, Emily. So this is an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll talk about well, introduce the permits team to you. We'll have a background of the types of trans types of permits that we have, which are primarily transportation and right of way, which breaks it down into points three and four. And then we'll go into the life of a permit. And there's a lot more that goes into it than one would think that goes into it uh, in order for the uh, system to go very smoothly. Go ahead, Emily, next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna introduce the permits team to you. Go ahead. I am very fortunate to have every single one of my six members on this team. They're very dedicated, they hustle, uh, they're focused, and their commitment to providing customer service to the stakeholders that we represent, both elected officials and uh, applicants at large, and the driving, the people that use our road right away, uh, it would not be possible without them. So I'm very grateful for all six of them. Lisa Jones is our permit clerk. She's like I like to call the front lines. She takes and receives the phone calls, the applications and payments when an application comes in. She answers many questions on our behalf uh, as she is trained by Emily uh, prior to uh, graduating over to permits uh, about a year ago. She's very skilled uh, with empathy. She's very skilled at listening and providing good guidance to uh, an applicant to when they have questions so that they feel confident moving forward and what they should expect. And very grateful for what she does. Uh, she does account oversight with liability insurance, securities, and permit finances. And we'll get a little bit into that uh, to your detail into the presentation. Next slide, Emma, please. All right, now introducing to you our two permit coordinators. Uh, once upon a time, these positions were filled by John Posgay and Angie Borrego. Uh, they have both since moved on. And since then, uh, we've hired, hired, promoted is a better word, uh, over a year ago, Lauren Purdy uh, to become our permits coordinator. And then John Miller came in last fall uh, to replace uh, Angie Borrego when she departed us for the city of Ann Arbor. Their roles are vital in the sense of they review the applications that come in, primarily driveway approaches, utilities, and miscellaneous activities. So what I do is I break it down by township odds and evens uh, between the two of them. Lauren has the, uh, the evens and John has the odds, so to speak. Uh, and when one's out, it gives the opportunity for the other one to fill in. I wanted them to have an entire aspect of the top county so that should one of them take a long leave of absence, sometimes unplanned, that we could keep the system going smoothly. I didn't want them to uh, be tied to just one type of an application. So that was my vision for why 
I broke it down into odds and evens. And coincidentally, between Pittsfield and Ypsilanti being an odd and an even, the numbers work out pretty evenly between the two of them, so neither one of them is overworked. They also do provide guidance and they issue permits. And then they do what I call field management. They go out there, they take a look at the uh, lay of the land before the, when the application is submitted and then during when the application is issued to make sure that in addition to our inspectors, they're out there keeping tabs of things to ensure that things are going well within the right of way. Next slide, Emily, please. All right, and then we have our two uh, inspectors slash enforcers. And I say that in a kind way. Uh, Larry Plezowitz has been with us, gosh, uh, he's one of our senior uh, employees here at the Road Commission throughout the agency, early 90s. Uh, he came from Canton, uh, Canton Township. And uh, Jared Powers, Jared uh, worked uh, originally with State Trunk Line, moved over to uh, going to Yard 1 and working up his way uh, to second in command for Yard 1 before deciding to jump over to permits and we're grateful that he did so. Their primary uh, roles is to do field inspections once permits are issued. Uh, if I have any complaints, we, as permits receive any complaints, sometimes I'll pick up the phone, give them a call. Hey, when you're in the area, could you please check this out? And they re report back to me on what they see. And then during uh, what we'll call seasonal weight restrictions, which is fast approaching, probably mm, within a month to six weeks, we'll have uh, Waymaster duties. Now they do Waymaster duties throughout the year, but their primary focus I would say outside of seasonal weight restrictions is field inspections. But from that time from, eh, I'll call late February to early April is when they're pretty much 100% focused on Waymaster duties. And then our two permit coordinators would focus on any field work, including myself uh, in the interim so that uh, we can divide and conquer. The uh, Waymasting is a clay class within a presentation within itself, so we won't get too deep into that. But if that's something that's of interest at a later date, maybe that's something you could broach the subject with, with Cheryl. Next slide, please. All right. Now we have uh, me, Mark McCullough, the senior project manager, and then Gary Strait, my lieutenant. Um, we primarily focus on the commercial plans that come in. Uh, so the big box stuff, I'll, I'll say, for instance, uh, Lowe's, it's Lowe's were coming to town, Home Depot, and then the site developments, the residential stuff, the condominiums, the single family home units. We look at those plans to make sure how they're going to interact with tying to the road right of way. We'll get into what we call traffic impact studies and road improvement agreements, which are essential uh, component to doing these commercial plan reviews for most cases. And then once that's uh, those are issued, If should they be applicable, then we, we work on really project management before the project is issued and then after, where we're eyes and ears, we're coordinating with our, court, our permit coordinators as well as our technicians, inspectors, to make sure everything's going smoothly in the field. Next slide, Emily, please. All right, so now we're going to transition to a little bit of background here. I like to think we have three, really we have four, um, purposes uh, with for the agency. First and foremost is customer service. Just like any department within the Road Commission, we're here to serve the people. That's first and foremost. But within that, what I like to do as part of that customer service is we're here to protect the road system. So we want to make sure that contractors are not, uh, we're, we're protecting our assets, whether they be culverts, ditches, the road itself, making sure that whatever activity they're performing under permit, sometimes not, and then we catch that, that it's being done safely and done correctly so that we're looking out for the public's best interest. We want to make sure that we're keeping the road right of way safe and convenient for all the users, not just the motorists themselves, but for cyclists and for walkers. So that could be sideways, uh, sideways, sidewalk projects that are occurring in the right of way as well. A lot of times these utility projects have a tendency to uh, have to temporarily close the sidewalk. It's, it's an unfortunate, necessary thing that has to be done, but the same token, we wanna keep things safe for them just as well. We don't wanna be just car centric. And then third, we wanna manage the third parties to ensure that all users are performing to the rules and regulations that were recently uh, approved by our board last year uh, to make sure that everything is being followed and procedures are being carried out. Next slide, please, Emily. 
So this really, you can fit, take permits out of this and put really any division within uh, the organization here because it kind of works in all ways. We just work, uh, mix the words around here. But we like to work within the town, with the townships who will put above us in that corresponding to them, whether uh, the, the big projects that are happening out there, uh, especially with the commercial developments and the residential developments, it's vital that we have feedback with one another that we are on the same team as much as possible so that we can guide the applicant to successful results. And then likewise, looking internally within the organization, it's important that we look out for our other teammates on the road commission, our people on operations that are taking care of the roadway themselves for the drainage. Engineering, uh, will the permit itself have any impact to a planned project that's in the CIP? And then administration, both finance that we work with us when uh, securities are submitted and released, and then also with Emily's team to make sure that we're communicating with the public so that we know an impact is going to occur via a permit that it can be translated to, well, it can get, the information can give it to Emily and then she can translate the engineering to, uh, for language that is easily understandable for the public at large. And she does a very good job at that. Emily, next slide, please. So this is a breakdown by the numbers in 2021. We issued 2,524 permits. Now, 65% of those are what we'll call transportation, and I'll break that down in a minute. It may sound like transportation takes up the majority of our time, but really it only probably takes up 10% of our day or our week, whichever you want to translate that to. And that's because of the simplicity of what we have, a system called Oxcart, and I'll get into that as well. The rest of it is broken down into utilities, driveways, commercial, and miscellaneous. Um, so the majority of our revenue comes in for the applications for transportation, but we also do uh, receive revenue to cover our costs, not to make a profit, for the time that we spend to have an application reviewed and processed. Next slide, Emily. And then I'm gonna break down into two different types of the, the main transport, the main permits that we break it down into, the transportation, which I'll call special moves, overweight, oversized. And then the right of way, which is the 90% I was talking about, which is the driveways, utilities, miscellaneous new developments. Next slide, Emily. All right, before I go any further, here's first break opportunity to ask any questions that the board might have. Mark, who's assigned for the county's broadband fiber project? Uh, for the most part, it comes through me. I take the lead on them for now. And when, it's, uh, when uh, it's more routine from them coming in on a regular basis, I will uh, delegate that to the two court permit coordinators, Lauren Purdy and John Miller. For the record, DCS Technology Design with Chris Scherer, who I believe you know, Yes. Been, uh, contracted with by the county to be the project manager for the gap filling initiative. So I would expect that you and Chris are going to renew your friendship and be seeing him, but he will be the project manager and the point of contact for all the work that's going to be, uh, be done. Although it's being done by separate awardees. He's, he's the person to mitigate questions, concerns, and so forth. That's great news. I really enjoy working with Chris. He's a professional in what he does. He's been doing it for, gosh, close to three decades. And we, we got a good rapport with one another two years ago. So this is good news to hear that he will be back involved again. Thanks for sharing. And the other, the four awardees will be uh, Washington Fiber Properties, Comcast, Charter Spectrum, and Midwest Energy and Communications. Very good. Well, we have a relationship with Midwestern as well, too. So good to hear. Questions at all? I don't see any. Okay. Well, with that, we will boogie along. Next slide, Emily. Okay. So when that 65% of our work, uh, that workload, but the permit applications that we come in, it can pretty much be broken down into five different segments of the transportation. And it has to do with oversized overweight. Anytime a vehicle um, has something that's really heavy that is subjected to potentially damaging our roadway or something that is too long or too high or too wide per the Michigan Vehicle Code, they need to uh, 
submit an application through us through the OxCart system. The common ones that we receive on our OxCart system are contractors mobilizing heavy equipment, such as this uh, greater uh, bulldozer that you see. Next slide, Emily. The manufactured housing community where they break down um, a, a double wide into two segments and deliver it to the site, such as this. Now this looks like a relocation of an existing home, but you get the drift. Next slide. Our public utilities, uh, DTE comes to mind here, especially their electric corporation. When they have a transformer that blows in an emergency, time is of the essence and they need to be able to get something out to us very quickly. They'll give us a phone call and say, hey Mark, uh, or hey Lisa, we've got an issue. We got to get a, this permit pronto in order to get our customers up and running again because these are very heavy uh, pieces of equipment and we work with them diligently to get those permits issued. Next slide, please. Gravel haulers. Now, this one's a little bit of a lightning rod in our township, excuse me, in our, in our county via some townships. But nonetheless, they're here. They're, they're a stakeholder of ours, and we need to serve them just like any other stakeholder that uh, submits an application. Gravel haulers pretty much work with us when they have haul routes that are renewed on an annual basis. And then after so many years, we would renegotiate a haul route agreement in order to have a roadway uh, likely improved so that their continued uh, use from the weights that they transport materials from the pits to whatever they're going, their job sites, that uh, the public is getting um, a smooth and reasonable, safe, convenient roadway in return for them using it. Next slide, please. And then we have what I call the miscellaneous. Now we don't have too many windmills in Washington County, but Lenaway County and Hillsdale County have lots and lots of them. And occasionally uh, you will get a special move permit with a windmill coming through Washtenaw County. Next slide, please, Emily. So this is the truck operators map. It is on our web page. And I know it's a bunch of colors and lines and grids. It's hard to, to articulate right here. But essentially what it does is this. It provides guidance to an applicant and is a reference for the road commission so when a person says, all right, I'm here, whether it's outside the county or inside the county, and I need to get to there, obviously inside the county, that they choose a route that's applicable for them, depending upon the time of the year, and also what is on the map itself. So are there weight restrictions on it, such as a culvert or a bridge loading? Um, is there a no trucking ordinance where they can't get there from here? whether it be a township or a road commission. So we use this as a guide to make sure that they can find the appropriate route to be able to get to the destination that they're seeking. Next slide, Emily. Now this is, the next two slides are snapshots. It's not the entirety, but it kind of gives you a flavor for what the OxCart system is. OxCart uh, has been a life changer and that's a little emphatic, but in a way you'll understand why. It used to take us, for me to say that, it used to take us a week to two 10, 15 years ago to be able to issue a transportation permit. Not because they were hard, but because the volume that we had was so significant and the other tasks that we had to do in our hand, applicants are waiting a long time to be able to get their permits to near to transport their goods. Time is money to them. So along came this system called OxCart. There were two guys in Illinois, they're uh, retired police officers. And they're like, you know, there's gotta be a better way for this system to work. And Matt McDonnell was one of the first people to work with them uh, to get an online system in Michigan along with, I believe it was uh, Leelanau County um, up in uh, by Traverse City, where the applicants basically submit their information as you see here, the year of their truck, their make, their model, the VIN, number of axles, uh, the, and all the other applicable information, what they're loading. And then they send it to us. They pay the fees, the, the nominal fees that go into OxCart for processing in it and giving them profit. The road commission doesn't pay any of it. It's all transferred to the applicant. And to some people they would say, well, wait a minute, that's, uh, is, is that a little bit unreasonable? And the feedback we've gotten from them is no, not absolutely not. They're glad to pay the, the uh, it's like it's it's dependent upon how much they pay. It's structured, but it, on a, on a, it's like somewhere between five and twenty dollars an application that they're paying. But they say time is money, and if this is what it takes to get us a permit in one to two days, yes, yes, please, we'll pay it over and over again. So really, OxCart has come to been a savior, and they've expanded throughout Illinois and Michigan, where close to all the road commissions are on board with using the OxCart system, and the state of Michigan is actually considering using them as well. Next slide, please, Emily. 
So here is what I would we would look like on our side. We select a permit. Uh, so we have single moves, we have round trips, we have an annuals, we have uh, special moves. And then there's a fee associated with that. Number of days that the permit's valid and it gives us their, their information. And then ultimately review it all. We check it with the roadmap, the um, trucking map, weight restrictions, all that. Make sure that the route that you're choosing is applicable, safe and accurate. And if everything's good, we hit accept and the permit electronically goes right to them and they're off to go. Next slide, Emily. Okay, I know I, I did a lot of information in a few slides, but I'm gonna use that as a stopping point to uh, ask, have the opportunity for commissioners to ask any questions. Commissioner McCollum? Uh, yes. Um, I would like to uh, just get an understanding of like the heavy trans, from one state to the other. Um, it sounds like the ox, ox cart is only in state, uh, Michigan and Illinois. So how do they get that permit to come through? Uh, say if they happen to come through Washtenaw County roads where they need a permit, how would they make that connection? Yeah, it's a fair question to ask. So it's getting better for them. But right now, if someone is not in an online system like Oxcart, and Oxcart's not the only player, but they're, I would say, one of the main players, it is upon the applicant to understand their route. And sometimes they have to make a phone call and call individual um, counties, cities, in order to get up to, I could say, 10 if it's a long enough route in order for them to get their permit. Um, it can be a very uh, challenging task, so to speak. So where it takes us a few days to issue a permit, it could take someone else longer to issue a permit, um, depending upon how, how long they're out at. Um, I'm optimistic that with the internet, people will get there and that it'll become more streamlined. But until then, that's what the uh, applicant has to face. Thanks, Mark. And I have another question. Please. I, I don't know if this applies to this, but the signs when you... Uh, when they have the uh, no truck signs, um, like where I live, they were doing construction and I believe these trucks didn't know where to go. So they came through my neighborhood. Uh, but is the no truck sign, is that enforceable? Can they get a ticket or is it just there to say, we don't want you coming through with a heavy yeah, no, it's a good question. So the, it's unfortunate to hear about your experience there, and I'm happy to learn more about it uh, through Cheryl, should you uh, want to pass that information along to us. Those signs are not paper uh, tigers. They do have teeth. Um, they are enforceable. And there's two different breakdowns that go with it. One, it, so let's just put it this way. It's if they have a destination, I'll use Sio Church Road as an example. So South Church Road for the majority of uh, it's in Lodi Township and Lima Township, in fact, all of it from 52 into the city is a designated no truck route by a traffic control order by the Washington County Road Commission. So that is something that our waymasters would enforce if those people doing business don't have a final location on South Church Road between 52 and um, the city of Ann Arbor. So in other words, they can't just like helicopter in. It's the only way they can get there. Then they have the rights to do that. But if I'm just traveling through the town, the county to get from Wayne to Jackson, I cannot use, uh, legally use South Church Road because that's a no through truck route and they have no final destination in there. So that's something that the county sheriff and when, when time permi permissible, uh, our two way masters would look into issue citations should they be violating the law and um, enforcing it so that uh, there's a presence out there so that other people don't try to do it themselves. The other aspect to it is that townships by state statute have the ability to issue the same type of no trucking ordinances without the permission of the Washtenaw County Road Commission. That brings a different set of problems up, but for the most part, that's something we'll rely upon uh, the sheriff's office to enforce or in like Pittsfield Township, they have their own police department, Northfield, they would enforce that, not the Washtenaw County Road because there's just too many of them out there that we can't uh, delegate resources to be able to take care of that. Does that answer your question, ma'am? 
and they no longer go down my street. The, the, uh, all of that kind of construction has stopped. So now, you know, everyone knows where to go. It was just in the beginning when it was happening. I believe they, because they changed some roads around, they didn't know where to go and they ended up coming down my street a couple of times. But everything's fine now. I'm good. And thank you for the information. Mark, You're welcome. Speak to the agricultural exemption to this no through truck situation? Barb, can you say that question again? I, I heard about 80% of it. Would you speak to the exemption for agriculture? With respect to no food truck routes. Yeah, I, I don't, Barb, I'll be candid. I don't know the law in detail about uh, farming. Um, maybe I, that's, that's something for me to look into. I rely heavily upon Larry and uh, Jared to know that information. So if there's something specific you'd like to know, I'd be happy to report back to you on that. Thank you. You're welcome. I see no other questions. Okay. All right, let's rock and roll. We're going to move on to the bulk of the work that occurs here in the permit section of the Road Commission, our right-of-way permits. Next slide, please, Emily. So the first category we'll get into is the driveway site distance. And this can be a little exciting, depending upon personalities that we encounter uh, for the applications. Uh, many of these have to do anytime, whether a commercial entity or a residential entity, or utility or farmer desires to gain access to the road right of way, they need to be able to have a permit for that. It's under the Highways Driv Drivers uh, Banners and Parades Act of 1969 that that was established. Anyone that had a driveway prior to 1969 is pretty much grandfathered in that they don't need a permit. But anyone thereafter in 1969 would have to get a permit from the road authority, in this case, the Washington County Road Commission, to meet what we'll call our procedures and regulations for permit activities. And in there, we have an entire section uh, related to site distance and what it takes to have safe access to the roadway so that all users have uh, convenient but safe um, transportation to use the road right of way that's not putting anyone at risk. Where things can become uh, a little bit um, exciting, so to speak, is a lot of these people uh, are purchasing properties uh, out in the country, and this is their dream home. They've been working for this for a long, long time, and it's a very exciting process. Uh, unfortunately, though, that they, you know, they have some challenging properties at times where site distances are hard to um, achieve. Emily, why don't you go to the next slide and I'll demonstrate why. And it's really for three different types of obstructions, what I'll call, lack of a better word, that occurs within our road system. You have the road alignment, so you have hills and valleys, crests and valleys. And if someone is located in a valley and they want their driveway there, but they're at, they're, the crest of a hill is left or right to them within a couple hundred feet, and it's a high-speed roadway, it can be problematic in that there's not sufficient sight distance to be able to uh, have the sight distance needed as spelled out in our procedures and regulations to issue a permit for that. And there's a process that goes into that with it involves our, our director of engineering slash county highway engineer uh, to be able to determine what is a reasonable circumstance to be able to issue a permit should we get to that. Another big subject is the trees and roadside brush. Um, it, it is necessary at times to be able to clear, have a line of sight in order for a driver who is coming out of a driveway and for the people approaching them on the main corridor themselves to see them pulling out so that there's not a, what we'll call an unnecessary collision. Well, maybe we just want a collision, period, not unnecessary not. And every time you, you introduce a driveway to a roadway, it creates um, what we call points. And uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the name of the, all of a sudden, but uh, conflict points in that anytime two vehicles cross paths with one another, it creates a conflict point. And in order to uh, make sure that those conflict points uh, work uh, in a safe and reasonable way, we have to give them sight distance. Emily, could you back up a slide one? Thank you. So as part of that, we measure site distance and there's different types of values that the property owner has to achieve and it's based on the speed limit of the road and the type of uh, driveway application that they have. So this kind of, this drawing here kind of gives you an idea of any types of obstacles 
that are within that shaded clear vision area, we desire to have that removed in order to provide a safe and reasonable roadway network system. Okay, Emily, back to the next slide. And then finally, roadside berms. Um, it's, you know, they, they want to, they're, they're up on a cliff, cliff. So, uh, they're up on a hillside. And in order to have to meet the elevation of the roadway, they have to cut an area out between a roadside berm in order to uh, gain access to that roadway. Well, the problem is, is that berm acts just as much the same way as a tree would or a road alignment where it creates a conflict. And sometimes where they have to go above and beyond to remove more of that uh, roadside back in order to achieve those sight lines. Next question, uh, next slide, Emily. Thank you. So this is a demonstration of what our, uh, our permit coordinators do on a regular basis to uh, investigate sight distance. So we have a target, that's what they're holding that orange obstacle there, object marker there. And that's to simulate what the driver's height of eye would be as they're coming out of their desired location. The applicant puts a stake in the ground, saying this is where we desire to have that location. We'll put the, uh, the offset distance per our procedures and regulations, which represents the target, which is the driver that's coming out. And then we do a drive, in this case, upstream, downstream of their desired location and measure the sight distance to see how it correlates with the charts within our procedures and regulations, which is based on the speed limit. If it exceeds those distances, they're good. They don't have anything to do, permit can be issued. But if it's less than that, now we start getting into checklists. And the first thing we ask ourselves is, okay, what if anything can be done to achieve that distance? Now, easy answer is remove the obstacles, but that can be expensive. Sometimes it gets, it's as simple as, okay, homeowner, I know you want your driveway right here. However, if you move it 200 feet to the left or to the right, you're gonna be able to get that sight distance without having any obstacles whatsoever to remove, which can be very expensive to them. And sometimes it's like a 50-50 proposition. Sometimes you're like, oh yeah, let's do that. I don't wanna do that. And then other times like, no, I really want my driveway there. I don't wanna put it over there. Sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not. But if there is legitimate reasons as far as legitimate, if there's, if there's ways to be able to meet our uh, sight distances within our procedures and regulations, uh, we have a tendency to um, make sure that it gets carried out so that uh, we're not putting the public at risk for something that could be avoided. Next slide, Emily. So this is an example of a before and after where we, you can see the target there and that line of sight where there's brush in the way. Uh, this is for uh, a commercial application for a um, solar panel in Augusta Township. Eh, actually, no, I take that back. This is ITC. This is a different one uh, for uh, to do access a existing utility line to do maintenance on it. So you can see that there's the brush in the way. We told them, hey, uh, in order to uh, achieve our regulations, you're gonna need to cut back some brush. Within a day, they were out there, they boom mowed it, took care of it, took it away. We went back out there, reviewed it again, and it, and it met it, it was clear. And you can see the stake in the ground as to where the, the applicant desired to have that location. Next slide, Emily. Okay. I didn't plan to have an app, a stopping point right there, but I bet there's a lot of questions related to residential driveways. So with that, I'll take questions right now on that. Oh, uh, yes, Mark. So going back to the diagram of the first one with the driveway. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So I'm just wondering, so there's site on the left from where I'm looking is more sight distance than on the right, and I don't see, is it trees beyond the ground or something, or brush? Mm -hmm. So those clear division areas are not symmetric in, in shape and size. And the reason for that is that it has to do with the on approaching driver is 12 foot offset from, so if, if you come to your left, that driver is more or less, um, I'll say eight feet from where they sit from the edge of the roadway. Whereas the other driver is further away from that offset. So now this is a dramatic example of, of, the, of the difference in sizes, but it gives, it, it's intentionally done that way to make the, the, it understood that you're going to need more sight distance when visually to the left than you do from the right. Did I explain that well, or do you need me to take another crack at it? 
No, I understand now because I now I see the car over there on the other side of the road. So yeah, that that would cut your um, sight distance on your right side down some. Any other questions on driveways? When are deceleration lanes required? Uh, those have to do with commercial applications and it has to do with the volume of traffic that's uh, in the speed of the roadway. So for a residential, there wouldn't be any of that. Would there that's, be good, that's a good question. For one of these big developments that are on the, on the way, I'm thinking of North Territorial and Whitmore Lake Road up there on the northwest corner. Yeah, so that's the Chester Hill development that we're referring to. And I will get into that when we talk about our traffic impact studies and road improvement agreements. So let's put a pin in that question and I'll get to it then because that's that's where it really applies. Thank you. You're welcome. I have another question, Mark. Um, yes, ma'am. Measuring site, this is the one where the um, they had to move the brush, which it looks like it was very significant once they moved it. I mean, once they, you know, cut it out. Um, what is the, because um, that's something that we roll back. So is there um, some sort of monitoring system in or? Yeah, so once a permit is issued, uh, it is the terms and conditions of the permit puts the onus on the property owner to maintain that site distance coming in and out. So should all of that grow back and there were an incident on that roadway, technically the property owner would be at fault should there be any type of litigation as far as them not as a term and condition maintaining site distance uh, to gain access to the roadway. In the perfect world, it'd be nice to be able to confirm that, but the resources would just never, we'd never have the resources to be able to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Okay, Emily, let's go to utilities. Okay, so um, I'm probably, uh, my, apologies if, uh, my apologies if I'm insulting anyone's intelligence, but we'll just give a 101 here because it is uh, fairly evident. We have pretty much two types of, of utilities, those that are aerial above the ground and those that are underground. And sometimes they have one or the other. They could be aerial and underground depending upon the circumstances and the scope of work that the, prop that the utility company is trying to accomplish. So typically the ones that we see aerial <coughs> are uh, power, electricity, and then what we'll call the secondary users, which is phone, internet, fiber. They, as those three that I just listed below, actually all of those people can also be underground as well, depending upon circumstances. What always has to be underground is gas, water, and sewer. And then occasionally there's some miscellaneous permits that get issued where, uh, depending upon circumstances, under unique circumstances, we would issue a permit for that. And what we do, John Postgate really beat this into me and for very good reasons, because he was very passionate about it, in that it is our job to make sure that we manage the right of way accordingly so it doesn't become the Wild West. And in other words, become a spaghetti bowl. We want order and placement and where utility goes in order for there to be space for future users, whether it be current stakeholders now or brand new companies that we haven't even been born yet to be able to utilize our right of way to provide a service that's allowed by law to the people at large in the county. So we wanna have a vision of make sure it makes sense today, but also make sure that it makes sense for the future so that it's regulated properly. And that's a little bit of a give and take. And that's where our permit coordinators come into place where they're having discussions with the property, owner, property owners, with sometimes property owners, but the utility companies in the sense of they have a very direct ways they're trying to limit their cost, understandably, is how they're trying to get from point A to point B. And then we're like, okay, I hear you. I understand you. Uh, now let, you know, we express our uh, concerns and why we don't like it at that particular location. And then we try to find a compromise as far as where that that utility can go in order like, okay, I know it's not your first location, but if it makes sense to deviate a little bit here or there, that's the end goal, that's the end result that we're trying to accomplish. Next slide, Emily, please. Okay, so this is a, a, a typical utility plan. This is right up Barb's wheelhouse. It is a fiber job, one, two, three net in Ann Arbor Township, where 
they are demonstrating to us where they want to go within the right of way, what other utilities um, exist, how close to the roadway are they, and what types of impacts will they have to the, the users of that roadway while not only putting it in, but if it's above ground, aerial, how could it impact them uh, long term? And there's little odds and ends to that. I won't go down that rabbit hole, but nonetheless, it's important for us to take a look at. Next slide, Emily. One of the key things that we work with Emily's team on is maintenance of traffic. And it's not just an Emily thing too. It has to do with our operations. It has to do with our engineering, our traffic and safety. Does it affect a traffic signal if they're in close proximity to a signal? Is this going to overlap with a, a CIP project? Is this gonna overlap with a, a project that Jim Harmon and his team is doing? So we wanna make sure that when we look at these plans, we're visualizing what they wanna do, what their intents are, and then how could it conflict with what we are trying to do here at the Road Commission? So that's what we call the maintenance of traffic plan. And then once we come to, sometimes we have to have a group discussion and talk it out to figure it out if it's a large scale project. Other times it's just a quick email or phone call. But once it gets sorted out and it's understood what the terms and conditions will be as part of that communication, we will relay that information to Emily when the time comes for them to work in the roadway so that people are uh, knowing what to expect, uh, whether it be a day, whether it be a week, whether it be a month, turn on circumstances of what that utility work will do to the road motoring public. Next slide, please, Emily. All right, didn't plan it to, I'll take uh, more questions right now because utilities is a big chunk of our work. Any questions on utilities? I do not see any questions. Okay. So we'll, we'll transition into what we'll call the development world of the commercial side. So Barb asked a question as far as when would you type of uh, A cell, D cell, acceleration, deceleration lane would go into um, an application. And it would be for projects such as this, Barb. Uh, you have your residentials type developments. Now this is Pittsfield Glen and Pittsfield Township on Morgan Road between US 23 and Platte Road. And when Gary and I take a look at these plans, we're looking to where we manage the access, where they access the road right of way. So it's called access management. And we wanna make sure that, okay, we understand similar to a residential driveway, you wanna go right here. But when you're having the amount of traffic that's gonna be coming in and out of this development, how is it gonna be impacting with the other existing driveways on that corridor? Sometimes it doesn't affect it whatsoever, but on a Carpenter Road or Platt Road or a Z Road, it can make a substantial difference as to where it is. And a couple hundred feet can make a big difference. So although they'll, they'll submit a plan and say, we wanna go here, we have the ability to, all we have to do per the law is give them safe and reasonable access. They don't get to dictate where they want their access points. But again, it all, it's all part of the communication and negotiation process to get something that they can live with. So we'll look at the access management, we'll look at drainage and the right of way. So we wanna make sure that we're not giving something to our operations team that they're gonna to have to manage in perpetuity. That's gonna be a complete uh, maintenance problem for them to have to deal with. And then we have the impacts to the roadways, which gets into the traffic impact studies. Next slide. Oh, and most roads are within the new developments are private roads. Uh, that's something our board approved, I think about 10 years ago. So unless it is a platted subdivision, uh, which is a very specific uh, means to be able to uh, record public right of way, the road commission is under no obligations to have those roads become public in order for us to maintain them and inherit them. Um, so most of them are private roads. Next slide, Emily. And then we get over into the commercial aspect. So what you hear, see here is the Amazon Distribution Center, uh, which is on Morgan Road and Carpenter Road. So the other side of US 23. Same concept. We're here to access, access management and how are they going to gain access to the public roadway. We look at the drainage and we look at the impacts to the roadway. Next slide, Emily. So this is where the rubber meets the road for the first thing that, for the developer. The first thing they need to be able to have to demonstrate to us is, okay, this is what I wanna do road commission. This is what I wanna do township. They have to look at the traffic that's gonna be generated from their development and figure out how it's gonna interact with what's there today and what's gonna be a happening around the community between day one and full build out year, which could be one year, it could be 10 years, depending upon the phasing of the situation. 
And that traffic impact study looks at the specific details as to where they're accessing the road right of way and what intersections upstream, downstream, left and right of it that it could potentially impacting where if they're degrading the level of service, in other words, a grade, uh, to a point that it is beyond reasonable as spelled out within our procedures and regulations, that developer is going to be required per that same uh, reference, have to be able to mitigate that. And mitigation is just a fancy word for fix it. Make it no worse than it is today, but oftentimes it's better by what they're doing. That's accomplished by left turn lanes into a development. Sometimes they need to signalize an intersection, provide left turn lanes. Sometimes they have to uh, pave a roadway due to uh, the amount of impacts they have on it, um, if it's gravel, if it's a gravel roadway. So that traffic impact study takes all of that data into um, consideration. We review it, it's done by a third party. So the developer hires uh, a traffic engineer who's qualified to do the work. In this case, you see Fleece and Vanderbrink, which is an excellent company, very reputable. And we talk it out. And a lot of times we get to the fruition where it's like, okay, uh, Jim Harmon back in 2003 with Alan Philbrick put this in motion with creating, the next slide will demonstrate this, road improvement agreements. And it's tied to the Driveways, Banners and Parades Act in order to make it legal for us to get those mitigation measures based upon the impacts that they're placing from the development. Next slide, Emily. So what you see here is a typical road improvement agreement, the cover page and the end page for signatures. We had five of these that were approved by our board last year in 2021. And in it is a mechanism of talking about the terms and conditions of what was agreed upon from the traffic impact study, what they need to do, what they're gonna fulfill, the timing of it, what expectations will be placed upon them as far as securities and insurance and contractors, payment as far as cost to the road commission. And it's once that agreement is signed by both parties, majority of time it then goes to the next step where Alan Philbrick will take it to the county court system where I, he, the way he explained it to me is it's nothing more than a friendly lawsuit where they don't even go in front of a judge and every judge in the circuit court system is aware of this system. <clears throat> where basically it's a consent judgment, that's what they call it, in that it's binding, it's legal, it's authorized, that this agreement that the road commission and the applicant agreed to is, uh, it lo locks out, it protects their interests and it protects ours. And a lot of credit goes to Jim Harmon and Alan Philbrick back in 2003. They created this model for other people to be the envy of the state, for us to come to them and say, man, I really wish we could do that. How do you do that? So credit to Jim and his uh, foresight back then to uh, put this back in motion and still use today, very much so. Next slide, Emily. So part of those agreements is security. Think of security as collateral. In other words, you got to make sure that you have sufficient funds in place, whether it be a bank letter of credit, which is basically a promissory note, or a cash check given to us, where they are protecting their interest, where they have a, what we'll call a cost estimate for all work that's occurring within the right of way. And then per our terms, and per our procedures and regulations, they're required to submit funds in the letter of credit or the cash check to be able to cover those costs should something go awry. It's very rare that it goes awry, but it can happen. And that's why it's there to protect, not just the road commission, but protect the motoring public. So should they default, we have some, a mechanism in place to fulfill that agreement. So it gets into the terms and financial conditions of it. And then once they fulfill those obligations, we release those funds back to uh, the applicant in this case, permit holder. Next slide, Emily. All right, I gave a lot there. Any questions on that subject? Uh, Mark, is that like um, putting in an escrow or something? Yes, ma'am, exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. I no, I just said thank you. Oh, okay, no other questions? Okay. All right, we're rounding third and we're coming home. So we're gonna talk about the life of the permit here. So this is what uh, an applicant would see on our webpage. As of last year, we have pretty much gone digital thanks to COVID. We were headed in that direction anyways, thankfully. Uh, that was a vision that Cheryl uh, shared with Matt and I that it's time uh, to go digital. That doesn't mean we still don't accept paper because we do accept paper for those that don't have access to an internet. 
Uh, but nonetheless, probably 90, 95% of the people want to go digital as far as submitting plans and to be able to submit applications. So this is what you see on our website for permit applications, where they would click on the lower uh, left corner for right away applications. Next slide, Emily. And then it would take them to this screen where they can see the different types of applications that they have, uh, residential, commercial, utility, miscellaneous, and it gives a subset of examples underneath them. If they have any questions, they call Lisa Jones, our permit clerk, uh, or sometimes if there's a hiccup and they send the wrong one, we'll guide them to say, yeah, we understand you, you meant this, but this is the one you really want to do. And it, it works out pretty quickly. It has streamlined our process so much that uh, applicants are being processed, I would say, on a realm of uh, a week sooner. And that that's for, for, for commercial applications or, or a homeowner, that's, that's big time to have it a week sooner than what we used to be able to provide them. Next slide, please, Emily. So once we receive that application, that link, they hit the submit button, it goes to a mailbox that's uh, managed by our permits clerk. She in return will then send them a PayPal link, Venmo PayPal owned by the same company. I didn't know that until a few weeks ago. Anyways, it's a link for payment. And per our rules and regulations, there is the fee schedule as far as what fees are required in order to cover our time to be able to review and process and manage that permit once it's in construction. So she sends them a link. It has the payment already amount in there. They submit it via credit card back to us. It's processed and they're off to the races. We're ready to uh, review the application. Next slide, Emily. So this is a, sp a spreadsheet that what we call up in the cloud. Um, Quinter can, Mr. Quinter can explain that a little bit more intelligently than I can, but essentially everyone has access to it at the same time. It's not sitting in anyone's computer. And this is what we have uh, for permit applications at one time where it receives the date that it's in, it's assigned to a person, it's got the application numbers and pertinent information so that when Lisa gets a question, when any of us get a question, or when we're trying to figure out what we need to do this day in order to get the process uh, going to issue a permit, who's at the top of the list, this plan law gives us that data so that we can either answer those questions or provide the services that the customer is expecting. Next slide, Emily. So these are typical types of construction projects that once the permit is issued and goes out to for construction that you'll see out there. These are some of the more glamorous projects. So you have the Superior Sanitary Pump Station that was on Clark Road um, between Hogback and Prospect on the north side of the roadway. And then you have the Salem Township Water Main Project there on the right that was on Godfordson Road. Next slide, Emily. The pig catcher station, which was a big fancy word we like to throw around out there last year, uh, which is basically a maintenance facility used by TT DTE gas to be able to service their gas main lines. Uh, that was off of the, near the intersection of Dixborough and Gettys Road uh, throughout last year. And then you have a typical paving of a left turn lane for this case, Bonarch Estates in Pittsfield Township, where they're providing safe refuge for automobiles to turn, to have ingress, egress, in and out of the site. Next slide, Emily, please. Okay, so the day in the life of a construction inspector, it's not to be difficult. We're there to serve the public uh, just like we are here in the office to do as well. But we have to make sure that certain things or needs are met. We wanna make sure that there's quality assurance. In other words, are they filing the spec book that our rules, our procedures and regulations references the Michigan Transportation Standard Specifications for construction. We wanna make sure that they're putting that asphalt in correctly. Are they digging correctly? Are they doing everything safely? Transitioning to safety, we wanna make sure that the job site makes sense out in the field. Are there signs missing? Are there barricades? Is traffic confused? Do we need to do something better and, and, and call an audible to make sure that something's done better? And then we wanna do decision-making. Yeah, a lot of questions out there. And a plan is just that. It's a plan, but it's not gospel. And sometimes, depending upon circumstances, we need to do it better or we need to do it faster. And that's what the, the inspector's job is out there in the field, to be able to the eyes and ears and have an uh, immediate answer for that contractor, to have the answers they need so that they can keep streamlining and, and meeting their timelines to uh, hit their uh, targets for their uh, developer. Next slide, Emily. And then I've, I've already talked about the community vacations aspect to it. So we provide that information over to Emily and her team, and then she will issue a road work advisory 
in order to uh, translate that to the public. And then we also put that on the wiki road list as well if we know something that's coming up in the permits world. Next slide, Emily. And then we have once, the, once it's built and we review it, it comes to what we call a punch list. So we'll, the inspector will go out there or a coordinator will go out there, we'll review it. We'll make sure that they've fulfilled all the terms and conditions in their permit and our procedures and regulations. If it does, it passes. And then we look into, okay, are there any outstanding invoices that they haven't paid that need to be paid before we release sureties? And then finally, we have the refunds. So if they have any monies left on file with us, we'll issue a check that goes to our board every two weeks uh, on the check log to be able to issue those refunds back to that property owner in order for us to close out the permit. And I believe that is the last slide. Yes. All right. That's all I have. And I have quite any questions I can answer. Mr. McCullough. Yes, Mark. Um, with the DTE gas uh, line replacement project for such a large area, did they get one permit or is it permit per area or? That's good. It's a good question. So there are 33 permits associated with that. And it's broken down by road network. And the reason why we break it down by road is that so we can track the type of work that they're doing in our precision system. If we gave them one permit, it would be nearly impossible for us to be able to figure out what roadways they're working on within the system. So if a, if a property owner calls us and say, um, I live on Share Road, we can go into our, our uh, precision software, put in applicable information with Share Road, and then we can get specific information related tied to that permit itself. So the long answer to a short question is, we break it down by roadway. Excellent, thank you. Welcome. I see no further questions, Mark. All right, well, it's a pleasure talking to you today, board. Thanks for your <laughs> presentation, Cheryl. All right, um, well, we covered a lot of ground today on a pretty diverse um, set of subjects. Obviously, a lot going on in traffic and safety and working with the sheriff's office specifically. Um, and then uh, in permits as well. Um, we're headed into a busy time of year, as Mark indicated. We'll be talking about springtime weight restrictions shortly and, and all of that. Um, I thought it was important for you to see an overview of how permitting works. It covers a lot of different areas in the permit area. So certainly happy to give additional information um, as we get into more specifics, but hopefully that was helpful information for all of you. Thank you. If there is nothing further, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this working session. So, second. Four. Right? Uh, oh, we need a roll call vote. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hello, who are you there? Commissioner Joanne McCollum. Yes. Commissioner Doug Fuller. Aye. And Commissioner Bart Fuller. Aye. We are adjourned. We will reconvene at one o'clock for our regular meeting. Thank you, everyone.